I think that in America, there are many people who look at China. They think it's a police state. They think that people must be feeling an intense form of oppression. I think they view it the same way that they might have viewed the Soviet Union when we were growing up in the 80s or so. And so that's really not the case in China. In China, many people have benefited from the economic boom that is slowing today and that many people still hold out hope or optimism in the policies and in the leadership of the central government. I want to ask you one question before we go back to square one and 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 go in chronological order. Um which is just that is there any one thing you hope that people will take away from this like Americans will take away from this that would enrich their understanding of China or China's perspective or anything? Um, well, I do think that, um, Bob, as you're well aware, the conversation on China in America these days has become very black and white. And what I hope that Americans take away from the book is, one, that there has been a diversity of viewpoints um, and cultures across China um, throughout modern Chinese history. So that um, as history progresses, there have been these very contingent moments when different viewpoints arise. And so there's no one fixed perspective that um, Chinese leaders or officials or citizens might adopt, but that a lot of it is in reaction to movements within China, in reaction to things that are going on outside China. And so contingency is an important element there in um, Chinese history. And so things are very malleable. Um, I do think that right now we're at a point in Chinese history where um, the authoritarian impulse is very strong and Xi Jinping is really channeling that and pushing that forward. So um, America and other nations, as well as citizens within China, are grappling with that at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, I think that um, one thing that is hard to convey in writing news articles on China is the sense of optimism that and um, hope that many Chinese have had in relation to the direction of the country and to actually central government policies for several decades now. And I think that um, in America, there are many people who look at China, they think it's a police state. They think that people must be under um, feeling an intense form of oppression. I think they view it the same way that they might have viewed the Soviet Union when we were growing up in the 80s um, or so. And so um, that's really not the case in China. In China, um, people, many people have benefited from the uh, decades long economic boom, a boom that is slowing today, and that many people still hold out hope or optimism in the, um, in the policies and in the leadership of the central government. There's a lot of complaints about corruption on the local level in China, but until very recently, people still felt fairly optimistic about the central leadership. I think that has shifted in the last few years um, with uh, Xi Jinping's direction and with the COVID era policies that he put in place um, that in part have led to the economic slowdown. So that's changing now, but um, a lot of Chinese citizens have been optimistic about the direction of the country. And they also feel that it is China's right to take its place as one of the preeminent nations in the world. They strongly believe that um, this feeling of patriotism or nationalism is deeply ingrained in um, a lot of the people who live in China proper. And it is not something that they believe in simply because of government propaganda. I think that in America, a lot of what we talk about, especially here in Washington, is, oh, the state imposes this propaganda on people. And because of that, they have these like they have these very intense feelings of nationalism. But in fact, um, I feel that there's a very strong grassroots element to that. Um, a lot of it is because of their awareness of Chinese history and of um, the Chinese Empire, the empire that I reference in the title, um, and also of the imperial power um, that China could become again uh, in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Now. The U.S. is kind of famous among other nations, <laughs> uh, certain kinds of other nations, especially for like lecturing them about how they should conduct their internal affairs. I mean, we would view it as a very, you know, laudable and noble concern with human rights or with 
uh, the virtue of liberal democracy or free speech, but sometimes people in those other nations uh, view it as lecturing. Uh, I know Xi Jinping does. Um, is is one thing you're saying that more Chinese people than we might think, you know, kind of react the same way? Uh, that 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 I mean, uh, the bottom line is: is the lecturing counterproductive in terms of its influence on actual Chinese grassroots opinion? Does it tend to only uh, increase uh, the support for Xi Jinping or what? That's a complicated question, Bob, because this is where the um, Chinese media and propaganda apparatus does play a role. Because the um, the messages that <clears throat> the U.S. tries to deliver to China are channeled through official state media. So then um, sometimes those lines are placed out of context. They're, the ferocity of them is heightened, obviously, by the Chinese propaganda apparatus. So there, there's a less undiluted view of the messages that America is trying to send to China than we would hope the citizens are getting. But I also do think you have a point in that the constant berating tone of a lot of um, you know uh, American official statements about China can get on the nerves of ordinary Chinese citizens, even if they heard it in the full context in which it's it is expressed. And I think they think that their country has come a long ways in recent decades and that the U.S. has exhibited many shortcomings itself in recent decades. Um, we can go back to um, the early 20, uh, 21st century, the Iraq war or the economic crisis that started in 2008 because of the U.S. financial system. These were huge markers for both Chinese officials and for Chinese citizens. And then we see America grappling with its own democratic shortfalls uh, today. And so I think they look at that and they say, who are you to tell us how to conduct our affairs? Yeah. I mean, the question arose for me during the part of your book when I guess it's around the time of the Olympics in Beijing and uh, some French protesters have D done something to convey their disapproval of China's policy toward Tibet. And there are these demonstrations by Chinese people of uh, some French retailer, and they also are complaining about CNN. And I kind of wondered, like, to what extent was that spontaneous? Uh, and it sounds to you, uh, to me, like you might say, well, it's, it's a little of both. I, I mean, th that, the, that the Chinese state-controlled uh, media probably played it in a way that encouraged uh that encouraged a reaction and for all I know there was the the actual kind of manipulative uh fomenting of a reaction I don't know by the government I don't know how those things play out but do you, did you have a sense observing that like how authentic yeah. it was I mean it's a it's as you're pointing out it's a complex interaction so the Chinese state media definitely plays a role um they amplify statements made by, for example, the Chinese foreign ministry. These are the messages that um, are being pushed out onto, say, the 7 p.m. news every night um, to people. At the same time, there um, this was at a moment when there was a strong feeling of patriotism or nationalism um, uh, that was arising in China. Um, the Olympics were around the corner. Uh, China, th that was a very symbolic moment where Chinese citizens felt that they were taking um, their place in the spotlight on the world stage. Um, world leaders are about to come for that. And uh, I think they really felt aggrieved by the fact that many people around the world had started criticizing China for uh, its crackdown on uh, Tibet and Tibetan regions at that time. And it was a very real crackdown. There were uh, security forces pushed out to those Western regions and really um, going at it against uh, Tibetan protesters. Um, in those areas because of violent riots that had taken place in Lhasa. That was a triggering event. And so mm -hmm. you had this worldwide reaction to that. Um, there were things like um, this movement called anti-CNN started by a Chinese citizen online that really galvanized people. And that was a grassroots movement that was then amplified by the government. So you had this interaction with people. And the government will sometimes want to play up these um, patriotic protests. They want to at least fan the flames of them. But sometimes they want to dial them down too. And they'll try and um, then pull back on the propaganda because they don't want mass protests in their streets. And they know that those can sometimes get out of control, as has happened, especially 
in nationalistic protests against Japan. 